Um, so thanks very much, Linda, and uh, uh, thanks uh, NBPA for in inviting me. It's been a, a couple of years since I've been to an NBPA event, and uh, I'm very glad to be here and to see people that I know, uh, have known for a number of years, uh, and um, uh, I'm pleased to be uh, able to talk to you today about acting in teams. And so um, just a kind of little brief start in terms of the challenge of chronic pain. I'm sure that uh, a lot of you will have uh, experienced patients saying this kind of thing uh, during the course of your career. Um, and it's a very common sort of thing that I used to hear quite regularly um, with, with uh, pain patients, uh, especially at that early part of their journey to try to uh, move from uh, a more kind of medical causative type of approach to pain towards, um, you know, well, I was trying to help them to move towards a more kind of uh, self-management type of approach. But we know that this, their suffering is multifactorial, and we know that the uh, response to pain can become part of the problem, and that um, such a the complexity in terms of the multifactorial nature of pain uh, requires a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of energy to try and sort of unpick that and try and um, uh, change the situation. Um, this is Viktor Frankl. Viktor Frankl was um, <coughs> a Jewish uh, psychiatrist who was interned in Dachau towards the end of World War II, where uh, he was um, uh, a camp doctor. And he wrote in Man's Search for Meaning, all about uh, how we can construct meaning out of uh, difficult uh, situations. And he found that his purpose and the thing that helped him to survive the concentration camps was that he took it upon himself to try and live well whilst under uh, the, the uh, very difficult situation he was in and to help other people to try and make sense of the experiences they were having. And one of the quotes from the book is, when we can no longer change a situation, we are challenged to change ourselves. And I think this is the situation that people find themselves in when they're kind of transitioning from that uh, part of their pain journey where they're recognizing this isn't actually getting any better. And I'm seeing all these people and it's, it's not actually changing. Um, so th it becomes really the challenge of change. And I'm going to share with you a quote from Mark Twain that I particularly like. Uh, the only person who likes change is a baby with a wet diaper. This is, uh, I'm glad to have this picture. This is, my, this is my son, Josh, who's now four. This is him in his first couple of weeks of life. Um, so we're looking forward to being a, a family of three now and, and having a small one. So, so change is very hard to do. Uh, human beings generally don't like change very much. Um, and so when things are hard to do, uh, we think, well, many hands can make light work. And I'm going to share with you a quote from Mother Teresa. She says, um, I can do things that you cannot. You can do things that I cannot. Together, we can do great things. And this is really sort of uh, my sense of working in teams. Like all of the work that I've ever done as a psychologist has been in, in teams. Uh, first of all, I was working in mental health teams. And there was, you know, the teams functioned reasonably well. And the people involved in those mental health teams were quite good uh, towards each other. Um, uh, good uh, professionals, but there was always a conceptual clash with people disagreeing about sort of what's the right approach towards mental health. Um, and then when I moved to Edinburgh and started working full-time in the pain team at the Western, I really felt that this was a very different culture, that there was a much more explicit recognition in chronic pain teams that each of us recognized that we each needed each other, that none of us could do our own jobs unless we had other people doing their jobs at the same time. And I think Mother Teresa's quote uh, shares that out quite nicely. So in some of the work that we're doing, we can think about um, in the pain team that um, some of the work is kind of broadly more psychosocial and a dimension up towards kind of broadly more biomedical, and that some of the tasks that we might do might be relatively specific to a particular profession, and, and others might be actually sort of much more shared. Um, so, for example, we heard earlier about uh, neuromodulation, and certainly the management and the follow-up and, and the assessment towards uh, 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 that treatment is very multidisciplinary, um, but the actual implantation, I think, is, is, is a much more bi biomedical piece and very specific. Uh, similarly, other interventional procedures are like that, prescribing a little less so, acupuncture, well, more people can do that than, than, than uh, just the doctors. Targeted exercises, getting towards more specific, but more towards the kind of um, social, but more general exercise advice is something that, that most of us would do uh, something of. Um, 
uh, and then and so on and so on. There's just kind of my thoughts rather than anything evidence-based. Um, specific thera- psychotherapies might be slightly more specific and more towards the psychosocial end. Um, and uh, pain education is kind of, we've heard a little bit about that today. Uh, again, something that, that really all pain uh, professionals should, should be uh, doing. Likewise, encouraging healthy activity, goal setting, uh, and helping people to change perspective. And so there's a whole variety of different tasks that we're doing as pain teams, some of which are quite specific to our uni-professional role and some of which are, are uh, much more shared. Um, and that the, how a particular team decides how it's going to manage those tasks, there's some variation in there. But um, uh, that collection of sort of both profession-specific and generic or shared approaches to uh, treatment, uh, I think, is a feature of teams, and I think it's very helpful. However, it isn't always plain sailing. Walter Lippmann, who's a Pulitzer-winning journalist, said, we all think alike, no one thinks very much. And so in teams, challenges in teams it should be regarded as the norm, that, that disagreement can be quite healthy, um, and that, that people coming together to work together isn't necessarily always going to be harmonious. Uh, and so, for example, things like um, teams themselves collectively underperforming can be a, a, a feature. Uh, things like role blurring. Teams seem to work best when people have clear uh, roles and a, a sense of what they do, each being unique rather than lots of kind of overlapping uh, between the roles. And that's not the situation that I just described in the specific and shared tasks um, uh, uh, slide. Um, so there's a potential for role blurring and kind of like lack of certainty about what it is that I'm doing and, and how I'm operating. Um, uh, communication patterns are extremely important in, in teams, particularly teams that are doing complex things. And so it's, especially when a team is pressured and doing something very complex, it's very, it's very easy for communication to, uh, to suffer and, and therefore the team underperforms. Leadership and leadership style has been shown to be extremely important in terms of the management of teams. Uh, and uh, I, I think it's interesting that, that um, a lot of the teams that, that I've worked in in the past... Um, the person who's leading the team is often has, has sometimes not necessarily been someone who's actually uh, employed to do that leadership, but is someone who's stepped in or uh, volunteering to do it uh, uh, and doesn't really have a lot of support, uh, sometimes um, you know, hasn't had additional training in how to do the sort of leadership of the team. And so it's kind of easy then to see how uh, that person himself may not be optimal in terms of how they help the team to address uh, uh, how it works together. There can be situations where conflicts are not resolved and that grudges are held. Um, equally, the opposite of that, that teams that, that don't hold grudges, teams that, that are able to kind of talk about disagreements effectively, they do better. Um, uh, Teams that have impaired autonomy. So, for example, one of the findings from Ellen Ostrow, who's a Nobel Prize winning economist that pr- produced a, a set of eight principles for healthy working teams, she found that one of the biggest ones is that the team itself has to be able to work as a team to make decisions and to, be, um, um, to have the autonomy to do what it, what, it, what it is set out to do. If a team, for example, has a task to do and then other people from outside the team keep interfering with that task and preventing the team from operating effectively, that team uh, will seriously underperform. And then similarly, in Ellen Ostrow's work as well, there's an aspect about kind of how members of teams monitor each other's input to the team and how they sanction people that basically don't pull their weight. Um, and so, and so th- uh, these kinds of challenges... It should not be seen as features of dysfunctional teams. They should be seen as being parts of being human beings who are working together. And so we should kind of expect, actually, that, that there's problems with team working. Um, and the fact that, that a lot of teams actually do work effectively and do seem to manage pretty well, uh, it, it sometimes actually is quite surprising when you think about how normative some of these um, uh, kinds of teamwork uh, underperformance issues can be. Um, one of the things that I think is um, a really um, coherent thing about uh, uh, being a psychologist that has uh, studied acceptance and commitment therapy uh, and the, 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 the behavioral science that's uh, a part of psych- uh, acceptance and commitment therapy is that um, uh, the model itself provides us with ways in which we can encounter uh, these kinds of problematic situations in teams. 
And the main thing that I want to introduce there is this idea of psychological flexibility. So uh, those of you who have kind of uh, read anything of acceptance and commitment therapy or done ACT training uh, will be aware of this idea about psychological flexibility. And, and to me, it is really one of the key things that is the... Uh, uh, a kind of helpful antidote to some of those problems that, that can arise in, in team working uh, and a, a useful place to stand and to think about whilst we address the complexity of meeting the challenge of change, meeting the challenge of chronic pain and meeting some of the challenges that we have in working together in teams. So psychological flexibility is our capacity to be aware in each moment of what it is that's influencing my behaviour and to make choices that lead to effective working in a moment-to-moment uh, capacity. So it's not just self-awareness. It's self-awareness in order to make choices about what I do uh, in my behavior. And a huge uh, range of research um, has shown that psychological flexibility is a, a predictor or an associate of a, a wide range of human behaviors uh, in both mental health fields and physical health fields, but also organizational psychology, stress management, team working, um, effective leadership, for example. All of these things, psychological flexibility, this capacity to be aware of what is it that's driving my behavior right now and to be able to make choices based upon that uh, awareness uh, so that we make choices that, that lead to effective working, this capacity has been shown to be implicated across uh, all these different fields. So um, when we deliver ACT, when we deliver acceptance and commitment therapy, the whole primary purpose of delivering ACT is increasing people's psychological flexibility. So what we might mean by that is someone's uh, capacity to, in this context, flexibly live with a chronic pain condition, to, to be able to make choices towards uh, living effectively even when uh, they have difficult, unpleasant pain sensations, uh, uh, fear of pain or stress about pain or mood problems or in association with pain. And the research evidence overwhelmingly shows that this is not a trait-like thing. It's not something you're born with. It's not something you have a genetic endowment towards. It is a, a clearly behavioral process that, like all behaviors, will increase with practice and that it can be fostered, trained, and practiced with reliable kind of ways. Um, and one of the things I think is really um, a special thing about the psychological flexibility model, in contrast to the place it was coming from, the traditional more kind of cognitive therapy and behavior therapy model, uh, the traditional cognitive therapy model, the problem with it is not that it doesn't work. It does work. There's lots of evidence that cognitive therapy is effective. But one aspect in particular that's problematic is that it has grown up as a model and a theory of abnormality. Uh, so that makes it highly likely that when we're trained in cognitive therapy and we apply it, we'll be implicitly standing in a place where we're applying it to others and seeing the other person as in some way psychologically disordered. Um, and that has a potential to create inequality, to create potentially stigmatizing interactions. And the psychological flexibility model is, by contrast, dimensional. Uh, it's a dimensional model that covers from the normal to the abnormal, the healthy to the unhealthy, the adaptive to the maladaptive, or in words of the psychological flexibility model, workable to unworkable in terms of how we respond and our strategies we use for responding. So this psychological flexibility um, model helps us to answer what is influencing my behavior and your behavior at any given moment for the purpose of maximizing the control that we have over our own behavioral choices. Um, and it applies just as much to the people who we call a clinician uh, as it does to the people that we call a patient. Uh, and I think that's actually a really strong and important and valuable feature of the model itself. Uh, because the kinds of things I talked about just before in terms of teams and problems that teams have mm. are exactly these kinds of things where we get stuck or we make choices about uh, or we get drawn into behaving in ways uh, in our uh, team working that uh, are ineffective or that don't work. So um, as an example, I want to just kind of share the idea that it is extremely common for human beings to get stuck. Um, and that we all have situations where things get sticky for us. So, for example, I'm not going to ask you to share this or to you know, uh, uh, write this down or anything, but just to kind of like reflect for yourself, and if you want, wish to after today's session, to think about what situations do you find make it harder to do your job? Where do you get stuck? And I don't necessarily mean resource-type situations, although that's kind of more of an external pressure. I mean, what things happen inside you that make it hard for you to do your job? 
So, for example, my own personal example, I find angry or particularly hostile people quite hard to be around. Uh, I find highly judgmental or highly critical people. That would be one situation that I'd find sort of fairly sticky. And I'd be likely um, to, in that situation, either kind of need approval or look for reassurance or try and do things that try and um, uh, show them that I'm kind of being submissive in some kind of a way. I try not to challenge them, try to avoid challenge in that kind of way. So that's kind of what the getting stuck looks like for me in that particular situation. Now, if, if I'm uh, really hooked into that, then I'll tend to avoid conflict. I might try and reduce the amount of time that I have to spend with this highly critical person uh, and be very glad if the uh, person uh, on reception tells me that they've just phoned to cancel, um, that kind of thing. Um, or, or even in some situations, I might even decide, well, oh, this person um, has a problem that's really not uh, for the chronic pain service. They need to be seen by primary care psychologist instead, and so refer them on. Th- those are the, the kinds of ways in which I might get stuck. If I'm doing my job well, if I'm, if I'm kind of like um, uh, help, being the, the most flexible that I can be, instead, I would probably try and stay with that person to try and lean in and get present with them, try to find, try to see if I can see the humanity in them. Uh, What is it that's happened to them that's made them so prickly? They probably weren't born this way. Uh, What age were they when they started being this kind of critical, pushy kind of a way? And what did they, what did that person who started to find that that was a way of working in the world, what did they actually need, you know? Uh, sometimes I might just, if I'm on a good day, if I'm trying to kind of be the best person I can be, I'll simply listen and allow them some space and allow responses to emerge and to unfold. Uh, but it's not always like that. Sometimes we get in these very sticky, stuck, kind of driven sort of situations where we're much less flexible. And teams get stuck too. So what situations make it harder for your team to perform optimally? Uh, where does your team uh, tend to get stuck? What does getting stuck look like for your team? What do you do as a team in those moments? Um, So uh, I'm quite happy to talk about myself and kind of the ways in which I am kind of um, psychologically flexible or inflexible. I don't think it's probably very fair if I also out my uh, team colleagues uh, that I've worked with now or in the past. So I think I uh, I won't do that. But it's something to kind of think about uh, the ways in which teams tend to get stuck. And there's all sorts of uh, a variety of different ways. Things like, for example, uh, simple things like people not coming to meetings. You know, there's the, the meeting people are supposed to be at and that someone doesn't keep coming. Uh, people not delivering on things they're meant to, sit, to, to have been delivering on. Um, uh, things stagnating or stalling. People maybe kind of not... Um, uh, uh, being able to handle disagreement in an effective way. And so they either kind of just deny that there's a disagreement there and keep it themselves, or, or actually kind of going out there and blasting other people. That has happened not in teams I've worked with, but I think that is a feature sometimes in some teams of kind of a lot of hostility and so forth. So, so we need to kind of recognize that, that at an individual level, not only do our uh, uh, patients get stuck, but we as clinicians get stuck with them. And in the job of being a team to do this job, uh, teams also get stuck as well. And that's, um, I think, described quite well by this ACT model of psychological flexibility and flexibility. So I don't know uh, whether people here are you know, fully familiar with um, the ACT model, but I'll just do a quick run through of it in case there's some people who, who are, are less familiar with it. So the ACT model is a behavioral psychology model that um, uh, it describes six overlapping and interdependent processes that feed into each other that basically create a state in which someone's behavior will be either inflexible and rigid or the flip side, which I'll show you in just a moment, more flexible. So the first of these is experiential avoidance, things that people do to kind of get rid of how they're feeling inside, unpleasant feelings. So thinking about some of our chronic pain patients, things that they do to avoid feeling pain would be staying in bed, um, taking, uh, overusing medication, uh, 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 misusing me- recreational gr- drugs, uh, alcohol, um, uh, not going out of the house, not doing very much, that kind of thing. Um, so these might be ways in which people kind of avoid pain. Uh, other things people might do that if they feel kind of um, uh, uh, 
that, that um, uh, pain is kind of beating them. And so instead of kind of that feeling of, of being beaten and given into pain, they were kind of like overactivity and sort of like, I'll, I'll show this pain, I'm not going to let it beat me. Uh, and so that might you know, look like overactivity, but actually could be another form of trying to get rid of something inside that, that the person doesn't like. The second thing, cognitive fusion, basically getting entangled in what our thoughts and our mind is giving us, the kind of, the, 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 the kind of uh, thoughts and beliefs that we might have. So getting kind of drawn into that, highly believing that. Uh, the statements that, that we make to ourselves like um, uh, really being governed by thoughts like this is going to damage me or, or this is going to really hurt. Um, uh, uh, or things like, uh, I remember... Uh, seeing a, a patient who said, um, the, the reason I still have pain is because I'm in the NHS, and if I could go privately, they would be able to cure me. Um, so it's kind of fusion with that belief kind of drove uh, a lot of his frustration and anger with, uh, with the, the healthcare system that he was in, encountering. A dominance of the past or the future, kind of being either kind of, what if I never return to work? Um, or, or why have I got this? This was my fault. This is because of what I did in the past. So being kind of basically dominated by past or future thinking rather than kind of being in the here and now. Uh, being kind of attached and wed to a story about ourselves. Um, uh, so, for example, just to flip from being using a patient example, I use a kind of healthcare professional example. Sometimes in uh, uh, training events that I do, uh, I'll ask someone if they would... Uh, I was talking to a, a down in Oxford recently... Uh, delivering training there, and there was a, a person in the audience who uh, we were talking about um, uh, someone who um, was um, a patient with depression, and I was asking this uh, person in the workshop, could she kind of lean in and ask the person just to kind of you know, create a little bit of space to feel what you're feeling, rather than trying to kind of shut it down too quickly, and um, the person in the workshop said, I, I can't do that, I'm a physiotherapist, I'm not a psychologist. So there's kind of an attachment to a story about, well, if you're a physio, you can't do that, rather than kind of, well, you know, before you were a physio, you were a human being. <laughs> let's, uh, let, let's, see whether, let's see whether it would be possible. Would it be possible just to kind of try it and see, see what would happen? And, of course, what was happening was that she was very kind of fused with this story about if I start that, it'll unravel and there'll be a whole can of worms opened up and I'll not know how to do, deal with it and so forth. And so, you know, that sort of... Um, Attachment to that story about what's possible to do when you're a physio was kind of in some way helping her to avoid that potential catastrophe, that dominance of a future. You see how these kind of uh, different processes overlap and feed into each other. A lack of clarity or contact with uh, our values of what we care about, what, what matters to us, um, is another piece of this model. And an inaction or impulsivity or, or, or doing things persistently to avoid things like, for example, avoiding going out of the house or... Um, you know, the clearest examples are things like compulsive hand washing where you're very persistent on activity but it's done to avoid something um, in action so for example a lot of our patients uh, pain patients would stay in bed a lot of the time or stay lying down a lot of the time or just not do things, so inactive so when these six psychological processes are occurring, someone's behaviour is likely to be you know, more rigid more tightly controlled, more avoidant and life really is more in that scenario about kind of uh, reducing someone's exposure to unpleasant uh, situations. Um, by contrast, the, the model of psychological flexibility gives us the, kind of the, the flip side of that. And that first step on that is this part that we've touched on a few times today already that we call willingness or acceptance. And we don't mean acceptance as in a kind of a resigned, defeated, tolerating, uh, giving in, that kind of thing. We mean... What we mean really is kind of willingness. You know, are you willing to have this unpleasant situation, this unpleasant feeling of pain, and at the same time not, not have it dictate to you what's possible and what's not, but together we'll find ways of taking small steps even when you have your, uh, your pain there. So willingness is not the same thing as liking it or wanting it or approving of it. It's simply, okay, I'm going to let go of my fighting with this thing and I'm going to allow it to be here so that I can then get on with the business of, right, what is a small step that I can make if I wasn't busy trying to fight this pain? Uh, cognitive diffusion, so being able simply to step back from our thinking, to see our thinking as our thinking, 
uh, to not necessarily buy or believe our thoughts, but just to see them as they are. They are thoughts, even even thoughts that are true. Um, uh, being in contact with the here and now, in the present moment, so using things like mindfulness skills, um, uh, using various activities, not just the kind of you know, uh, traditional formal kind of mindfulness meditation, but a whole wide variety of different ways of uh, cultivating that mindful present moment awareness. Flexible perspective taking on our stories, so that our stories are important to us. We're not saying they're not important. We're not saying they have to kind of be jettisoned, but that, that we know that they are there. They're part of our history. They're part of how we've learned to be in the world, but they don't have to be in charge. And helping us to kind of notice, when does a story about myself help me? When does it facilitate me? And when does it actually get in the way? Then that's a really, that can lead to greater flexibility about what I choose to do in, uh, in my behavior. Clarity and contact with personally chosen values. So basically the answer to what is it that you care about? What is it that matters to you? And we need to think about this from the point of view of uh, the environment that people come from. Uh, for example, uh, for, for how many of the clients that we work with do they come from an environment where someone has regularly asked them, uh, what is it that you care about? And has listened when the person talks back uh, and said, yeah, I can see that. You know, I'll help you work towards that. So we need to think about in our work as therapists, you know, that's part of what our work is going to be about, helping people to move towards that kind of a conversation. Uh, that things that you would choose, things that you would uh, want to uh, matter to you, uh, that's what's going to matter to us in our work together. And then making goals, committed steps, committed actions towards values. That when um, um, if these are specific goals, specific behavioural steps. So when these six processes are occurring, we think the person is in a very much more psychologically flexible state. And so then they're able to have greater choice over their behaviour, greater control over what they do moment to moment, uh, rather than uh, uh, life being about a relentless pursuit of pain control, of trying to get rid of distress, to get rid of things. Life is more about, okay, can we uh, stop fighting with uh, what's going on and instead make our work be about uh, what could be a small step that you could take towards what you would care about in a world where you get to choose. And that's the essence of the psychological flexibility model. Um, but of course, there's levels of delivery. You know, so we don't necessarily expect everyone uh, to be here using ACT as a full package. We would want everyone in a team, for example, if, if your team was going down the route of um, developing a kind of ACT-based team, um, you'd want, for example, to have that everyone knows about ACT and that people deliver their own work, their own kind of uni-professional work, in a way that's ACT-consistent. So it's not going to make a lot of sense if your team is organized around an ACT principle if one member of the team is saying, well, once you get your pain under control, then we'll start to get you moving uh, towards other things. Uh, so you want everyone to do their own work in an ACT-consistent way. And you might have some members of the team using some ACT techniques um, within the uh, context of doing their own kind of work. Um, um, or, or, or doing parts of a treatment package using some ACT techniques. Um, and then some members of the team might be using ACT as a, a full package. So coming back to this level here, sort of, you know, if, if, uh, if you want to think about, you know, how you would do your own, you know, without becoming an ACT therapist as such, how would you do your own uh, practice in an ACT consistent way? Well, I think one of the themes we've talked about a little bit today has been about this overarching goal of living well with pain. And so if we make that the overarching goal of our work is about living well with pain, for some people that might be through a reduction in pain, but for others it may not be, um, rather than seeing symptom reduction as the end goal. I think helping to develop your own self-awareness, developing your own sense of what is it that pulls me this way, pulls me that way, what is it that kind of leads me to do certain things and not do other things, uh, developing an openness to uncertainty, that, that it's okay not to know 100% of the time, uh, that we can kind of operate still effectively from a principled place, even if we're not 100% sure uh, what the right thing to do is, and trying to help the uh, patient to develop that same kind of like, well, we, we're maybe not 100% sure exactly what to do, but can we try this and then see what happens? It's kind of almost like an experimental kind of approach to 
uh, their own um, choices. Uh, seeing the patient as a whole person rather than as a problem. Uh, I think that's one of the things that we see in some of the uh, things that Katie talked about earlier in terms of um, uh, the journey that people have gone on, the, the, the time it takes someone to get to professionals like ourselves, uh, is that, that often uh, other parts of the healthcare system focus really sort of quite narrowly on this thing, I'm going to look at this thing, is that dysfunctional in some kind of way? No, back to your GP. So we want to kind of sort of really develop that sense of seeing the person, uh, uh, the whole person, rather than a kind of um, uh, a narrow kind of focus on problems. Not avoiding what's tricky, if we can avoid it. We're not going to be able to do that 100% of the time, I don't think. Uh, letting go of needing to do something or fixing things as the only way uh, forward. Uh, sometimes being there, witnessing, um, helping someone else to make choices, rather than kind of rushing in to fix something, may be uh, a helpful thing. Uh, being guided by your own values for becoming a health professional. So what was it that led you to want to be a health professional in the first place? Let's see if we can make each day at your work be about that rather than a focus on just getting through the shift or getting to the end of the week. Uh, that would be at consistent practice to be guided by your own values for becoming a health professional. And kind of holding a bit like the, the uh, person I mentioned before in the training workshop in Oxford, holding professional rules just a little bit more lightly and just seeing whether, okay, yeah, these, these professional roles are very helpful and they orientate us to what we have to do. We don't want to throw them away. But we want to perhaps kind of think about when they help us and when they hinder us. And so I'm going to share with you an example of uh, probably the best um, formed version I've seen of that, and that's the, the model down in uh, the Bath Royal National Hospital. Um, uh, they've got a very good um, program there that's kind of very f um, orientated around the ACT model. So they have, a, uh, they have some nursing involvement, not, not very much, but some, they have a, a nurse employed there. They have a pain physician who's employed there sessionally, but they're not really... The pain physician sort of is there kind of early on for things like assessment optimizing pharmacology, shifting to a less medicalized perspective, giving practical help, that kind of thing, sort of facilitating change, if you like. Um, but they don't really have an awful lot of involvement on the actual um, pain management program as such. Then they have physios, uh, who are really working a lot on quality and range of movement, on strength and on stamina, and enhancing people's capacity. Uh, in some ways, you can almost think about it like as a, if you, if, if you were to think about it as a metaphor of a bit like a production line, they then sort of pass on to the occupational therapist who uses that enhanced capacity to work on enhancing activity, activities, values, goals, planning, skills building, and so forth. And then the psychologist and the team is about trying to help them to maintain that activity by overcoming barriers, using mindfulness skills, using act skills, and so forth. And so uh, each of the different kind of professions has their own particular uni-professional role, but they're all linked together, and they see each of their contribution as part of a bigger whole of a shared perspective. Uh, I'm going to share this little cartoon with you about shared perspectives. Remember, there's a, kind of, there's a big sort of fashion for sort of mission statements for a while, and some of them are, like, really bad, uh, and so we don't necessarily want to get into the business of writing mission statements, but I think what they did do is they express very succinctly um, a shared perspective about what is our purpose. And I think that is then really helpful if, if together as a team you have a sense of what is our purpose, what's, what, that's clear and simple. Um, and, and, and that in some ways you can link to this kind of psychological flexibility model as being about what are our values? Like what do we choose to matter to us as a team? You know, what do we choose? What, what do we care about? What, what methods are we going to use to pursue that? Um, that shared perspective, so for example, having a model like the ACT model, it doesn't have to be the ACT model, you could have a, a cognitive therapy-based model and other models, but uh, this talks about an ACT model. Uh, if you have a model that is a shared perspective, then it gives you language and ideas and concepts that can aid communication between the team, and it also then clarifies how each individual in the team is going to contribute to the whole team's purpose. The other thing is that you can share tools so, for example, one of the most powerful tools I've found in uh, delivering active patients is the use of an organizing metaphor. So a metaphor is a metaphorical way of talking about the problem that sort of conveys implicitly, here's how I think the situation is working, 
uh, and here's how I think our work's going to help. And so the sailing boat metaphor is one that I came up with because the, the existing metaphors in the ACT model at the time I didn't really think worked particularly well. So in this me- metaphor, I would typically deliver this after maybe sort of uh, towards the end of the first session or maybe kind of halfway through the second session after assessment, where in the assessment work we've been looking at all the strategies the person has been doing to try and live their life. And in general, what we've come out with is that a lot of different strategies serve the purpose of trying to get rid of pain. And that the broad strategy the person is using is, once I get rid of pain, then I'll be able to get on with life. So I say something like, we can think a little bit of this situation a little bit like that you're uh, sailing a boat. And imagine that, um, you know, uh, as you grew up in life, you can have your boat and... uh, you sort of learned that um, at various times in life you'll, uh, you'll encounter some adversity. It's almost like you, know, you get into kind of stormy weather and that if waves come into your boat and you get water in your boat, the thing to do is to get rid of the water uh, and, and that, will, that will then allow you to keep sailing. So, so here's a baler and this is, this is what you use when adversity comes, try and get rid of uh, what's going on, um, the, the adversity. And so you go, okay, thank you very much, and you put that into the locker, and then you sort of carry on sailing. And at some point in the last sort of few years, uh, some very big waves have hit your boat. Uh, these are waves that are pain, uh, stress, mood, uh, problems with motivation. Uh, and now they're all in the bottom of your boat, this kind of water. And you've done the logical thing. You've thought, right, let's try and get rid of that. Let's get in there with that bale and we'll try and get rid of that water. And you've tried a lot of different ways of bailing. You've been to uh, that clinic there. You tried that medication there. All different ways of trying to get rid of the water. You tried acupuncture. You tried hypnotherapy. More ways of trying to uh, bail out. And and here we are together. You've come to see me to see, have I got a different way of bailing? And I don't really want to be another person who's on that list of people that have disappointed you and have not worked. So let me ask you this. First of all, does your experience tell you you've tried really hard at the bail and you've really tried to get rid of this water? Usually people say, yeah, put so much effort into this. And what's your sense? Is your boat dry? And people usually say, no, I still have pain. So you say, okay, so what if our work was about something very different? That instead of me trying to kind of come up with other ways of bailing out, because you've tried all these different things, that our work would be about beginning to kind of consider where was it that I was sailing this boat anyway? Before I got so drawn down at the bottom of the boat, where was it I was trying to go? And let's make your and my work be about looking up and seeing, okay, where do I want to go? Okay. And even if it's really slowly at first, our work will be about gradually moving away from bailing and onto a heading that's kind of more in that direction of where you want to go. And we'll, we'll see if we can get our work to be about just getting the boat slowly moving. Now, if that's what our work would be about, first of all, would you be willing to have some water still in the boat if we could get you moving in the direction that you'd want to go? So you can see we're kind of starting setting something up. The second thing I might then say would be something like, and if our work was really about trying to get the boat moving, and right, right now you've got your hands full with this bailing, what's the, what's the first thing that we have to get you to do? Is kind of let go of the things that aren't working and start really looking with me, and where is it that I want to go to? Now, It'll be slow, and it'll be you know little bit by bit at first. But that's what that's what I think. That's how I think I could be useful to you. So that kind of shared metaphor, and there's a variety of different ones. It doesn't have to be the sailing boat one. But that shared metaphor um, can be very organising for a clinician, for a patient, and for the rest of the team. The whole team can then share, you know, what's what's uh, uh, you know. So for example. If I've delivered that metaphor and it's landed well and the patient and I are working together quite well and they start to tell me something that I think sounds like a kind of re-emergence of a control, avoid, get rid of strategy, I can say it sounds like that you got hooked back into kind of trying to bail again. What, w- what would be a thing you could do instead to sort of like drop that and start to, you know, let's think about where we want to take this boat. You know, slowly, slowly at first. So then that kind of uh, organizing metaphor can, sh- can be something that can be shared and the whole team can use it. 
Other tools that um, uh, having a shared perspective can share is other tools. So this one, for example, is a, a simplified way of sharing the ACT model that uh, we can think of it, instead of being six processes, we can think of it as three broad pillars. So developing an open response style. Are you open to what life's giving you? Um, developing a centered way of being. Are you kind of here now, uh, you know, standing with yourself rather than kind of uh, hooked off into feared futures or um, regretted pasts? Uh, and are you engaged? Are you kind of like, is the purpose of what's going on right now about something important to you? So really sort of simplifying the ACT model from being six, you know, uh, odd jargony processes to being simply, you know, are we trying to help this person to become more open, centered, and engaged, that kind of thing. Uh, so so what, what's the evidence that, that any of this kind of stuff has any relevance? Well, there's, there's not actually an awful lot of uh, training evidence. There's an awful lot now of ACT evidence for um, um, the effectiveness of the ACT model as a therapeutic approach, over 130 randomized controlled trials, over 30 different studies in chronic pain, leading the, um, uh, not all randomized control trials, only a couple of randomized control trials, uh, but leading the American Psychological Association to give um, chronic, uh, act for chronic pain a, a strong research support endorsement. Um, but the, in terms of looking at ACT as a training intervention and ACT as a team-focused intervention, there's less there. There's only about 14 articles altogether. This one's particularly relevant. This is by Estelle Barker and Lance McCracken. They did a qualitative and uh, quantitative study, mixed method study, looking at moving the um, St. Thomas's group from being a CBT-focused pain management program to being an ACT-focused pain management program. And they found that the main theme was that transition can be very uncomfortable. It can be very de-skilling. People feel devalued and that, that what they were doing previously wasn't, uh, wasn't valued. However, uh, as they stuck with it and gave it a bit more time, they found it was also exciting and really stimulating. And they felt an enhanced level of support from each other. They felt that the team became more cohesive, greater self-awareness, greater presence, and greater contact with their own values. Uh, I'm just going to sort of, I'm not going to go through each one of these in detail, but just to sort of show you that another field of research in this area has been to use uh, ACT interventions for health professionals, more in the context of kind of stress management, burnout type of things. So that's been done with clinical psychology uh, trainees in, uh, in Australia, uh, also um, uh, intellectual disability staff in, in um, uh, Mississippi, and here in Edinburgh, this is some colleagues of mine that did a piece of work with um, uh, intellectual disability staff, with challenging behaviour uh, patients, uh, social workers. Um, uh, this was across general um, uh, human services workers in kind of local authorities and in NHS settings. Um, this was uh, with mental health practitioners. And this is a piece of work that I was involved with in terms of training um, mainly therapists, CBT therapists, psychologists and so forth. And the broad findings from these studies are that when you do ACT training, ACT intervention with teams, that it helps improve burnout, it, people have reduced stress, distress, greater life satisfaction. They have reduced self-doubt about what they're doing. They learn how to be more self-compassionate. They learn how to be more mindful, and uh, they enhance their own self-care, and they're able to more consistently live their values, including their professional values of how they want to be with uh, their clients. And so the last bit I'm going to leave you with as a kind of take-home message, I suppose, of the, the whole of this is that um, uh, the, the, um, the threads of what we do weave into a whole life. It, our, our time can't be saved. It can only be spent. And so we need to sort of think about how we spend our time and to spend it wisely. And the values that we choose, the goals that we set for ourselves, the activities that we engage in, our interests, our hobbies, our pastimes, our relationships, our families, our children, how we treat our colleagues, how we treat our planet, how we treat our communities, and so forth. These, these qualities that we choose to make matter to us, we, we select them as important to us. These are the threads that we weave together to form a life, a whole life. And in the past, uh, older uh, ropes, manufacturing, they used to splice the rope together out of the same material, as you can see here. Modern ropes are quite different. Modern ropes tend to be made with a, a strong, flexible, wear-resistant outer coating that kind of you know, has the, the, the benefits of that kind of wear resistance, but is often kind of not got great tensile strength. And the core is made from a strong material that's really kind of strong for the tensile strength of it. 
So as we consider how we braid the lives, the threads of our lives together into a strong, flexible, healthy, and hopefully long rope, I encourage everybody that I train with, and health care staff in particular, to make the core of their rope something about how they relate to themselves. Uh, Starting with how we treat ourselves, how we talk to ourselves in private moments is really important. And we we implicitly then pass that on to others. So as an example, imagine you have a child that has two different teachers. And the first teacher says things like, no, you made a mistake, do it again. Uh, You aren't trying, you're lazy. This is typical of you. Have you even practiced this week? The second teacher says, well, that wasn't quite right. Let's go back, we'll try again. Keep working at it. You're trying really hard, I can see that. Good effort. That's the way. Keep going. Like which of these two teachers would you want for your child? And you know, which of these teachers are you tending to be for yourself? Like developing self-compassion, developing self-acceptance, and the courage to really pursue values, to pursue what you care about, is a really hard road to walk. And so... It really, this ACT model, I think, involves us in a conversation with ourselves and with each other about what matters, about how we live and how we work together. And the psychological flexibility model really, I think, provides us with a simple set of principles and practices that facilitate our engagement in that kind of a conversation. And it could be that in helping people with chronic pain to change, our own climbing of our own hills may be one of our greatest allies. Thanks very much.